Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Maria. I'm product marketing manager at Excellate, and today I'm going to be your host. So let's see. I see people already started to join. Uh, let give, let's give them a couple of minutes to settle in. So yeah, while people are getting uh, getting used to Zoom, I don't know if you need to get to used to Zoom, but anyway, let us know where you're joining from. I'm sitting in our head office in Belgium. Um, where are you sitting on maybe standing? Or maybe even lying down, maybe it's that time of day for you. Austin, I mean, Austin, that one is in Texas? That's so far away, thank you for joining. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Okay, so Shruti, I heard that there is a nice in there, wow. Nice, thank you guys, thank you for joining. London. Nice. Um, I, I know Shruti, you are in, in Amsterdam, and I also heard that the, the weather there is as miserable uh, miserable as here in Belgium. So we're surviving, we're doing everything we can. <laughs> yeah, I heard that tulip season is actually helping. Yes, it is. Nice. Okay, so let's see. Okay, I think um I think we are ready to go. Um so let me, guys, share my screen. Okay, just uh, please drop me a quick, quick uh, thumb up that you can see my screen. Can you? Hey, is there? A... Yes. Okay, nice. Um, yeah. Thanks, 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 guys. Okay, nice. Um, again, guys, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar with a long but informative name, Resolve Tickets Faster, Focus on Solution Delivery with uh, Service Desk and Development Integration. So, um, yes. Um, so today we're going to talk about why this topic is actually important and we need to address it and how integration can help you to align these teams. Uh, before we're going to go into the introduction, a little bit of the housekeeping rules. So first of all, as you can see, the webinar is being recorded. So as soon as it is over, we're going to share the recording with you and you're welcome to share it with your colleagues and anyone who might be interested in this topic. Um, also, we welcome your comments and questions, but guys, let's uh, keep the um casual conversations in the comment section and please post your questions in the q and a section below on your tab in zoom um okay now i think that's it so let's go into the uh, introducing our uh great speakers and let's start with shruti nayak uh it product advocate at atlassian shruti the floor is yours thanks marian Hi, uh, so my name is Shruti and I'm an ITSM pre-sales specialist at Atlassian. Um, I work with customers in their product evaluation journey. So I help connect Atlassian solutions with customer needs, map the requirements to our uh, product capabilities. Um, as you know, at Atlassian, we develop collaboration, development, and uh, issue tracking software for teams. Uh, most of them would have heard uh, Jira software, which is a workflow management system that would enable your team to manage your work and projects. And uh, Confluence, which is a content collaboration platform, Jira service management, uh, the ITSM tool. We also have Bitbucket, Jira work management, and many more products to come. Yes, I know. Sorry, guys, I was muted for a second. Uh, and it's way too early for this. No, no, no. We have some technical questions out here, guys. Okay, so next up is our own uh, Majid, uh, uh, full name, uh, please, <laughs> Majid Sayed Hassan, our own technical expert at Excellate. Thank you, Maria. And it's an absolute pleasure to be part of this webinar today. So my name is Majid. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm usually based out of Pakistan, but right now I'm based uh, out of our lovely office here in Antwerp, Belgium. A uh, very short intro to myself would be that I've spent around two decades within the IT industry in one uh, capacity or another, but it's never really been like a straight line path. So it's evolved from being a web developer to a teacher, to a support engineer, and now being an integration expert. So it's been uh, a fun ride all in all. Uh, so I have quite a bit of uh, working experience providing enterprise customers with uh, high level of support. and that 
uh, seven, eight years of experience kind of gave me a very interesting insight into the world of how support teams work, how they coordinate and what the challenges are. Now, one of the biggest challenges that you come across in any support team of any size is usually collaboration with uh, external parties, with external teams. And one of the biggest ones being the developers uh, who own those products. So the situation is kind of made a little bit more complex because this collaboration needs to be in real time. And it also needs to be dictated within the rules of uh, the business itself. Like, uh, not, for instance, like not every client facing conversation should go over to the developers and vice versa. Well, I mean, whatever the business rules uh, happen to be in that case. So that support experience that I had kind of led me into uh, this current role as an integration expert at Exalate. And so I'll tell you a little bit about what Exalate is. If nobody's come across it before, it's a bi-directional uh, integration solution which syncs ITSM systems. So essentially, uh, a team working in one ITSM system wants to collaborate with a totally independent team or a totally independent organization working in some other platform, and uh, they want to keep this conversation in sync in real time. That's where Xlate comes in. But to be honest, uh, syncing of those uh, two systems is just the start of it. So we make sure that we sync it absolutely securely. We ensure that the integration keeps pace as you scale and you grow and we keep pace with the issue trackers themselves. So that's a little bit about myself. Back to Maria, thank you. Thank you, Majid. And for the strong uh, finish for our, uh, for our round of introductions, uh, Jordan van Bohart uh, from Brainsburg. Yes, Jordan, I was practicing uh, pronouncing the last name. <laughs> it was very well pronounced, thank you. <laughs> Um, so I'm Jordan, I'm, I work at BrainSquare as a service delivery manager. Uh, BrainSquare is a, an IT um, company and a, a strategic IT partner. We do application development, we do integrations, uh, we do collaboration tools, which is specifically where I'm most active in. Um, we are an Atlassian solution partner, we are an Xlate certified um, partner and a Microsoft Gold partner. Yes, I had to say all of that. <laughs> um, I myself work at BrainSquare for three and a half years now. Um, I lead a team of experts doing all kinds of fun stuff going from the Atlassian tools, but also Xlate integrations or um, we do a lot of support on those collaboration tools as well, but basically figuring out whatever the customer needs we help them get it uh, get it done. Right, thank you so much. Uh, happy to have you all, all guys here. So um, yeah, let's continue with our uh, webinar. So before we move on into the actual topics, I have a quick a question for our audience. So let's run a quick poll on, yeah, uh, on some questions that we have for you. So, and let's do it. So the question is this. So what does your organization do right now to keep support and development teams aligned? So you have a couple of minutes, guys, to uh, vote for, for the uh, reply that works the best for you. And we're going to end the poll in just a few seconds. Nice. I see some results are coming in. Nice, nice, nice. OK, let's give it uh, 10 more seconds. So you have five, four, three, two. One. Oh, they're changing. Okay. Okay. I'll give it one <laughs> a couple of more seconds. Okay. So I think um, we are done. Let's end the poll and let's see the results. Actually, it's pretty interesting. So um, looks like a lot of people are using Slack and uh, Microsoft Teams, just a chatting tool to exchange information. Also, they already use an integration tool. That's cool. Uh, let's look into that. Oh, also, some people are using Google Doc to keep everyone aligned and updated. Um, oh yeah, and some people are not sure. So, which is good that this is this is why you're here. This is great. Okay, then let's let's continue. Okay, so um, before like now we ready to start, I think, and let's uh, start for the question. So why, why we're here, why support and development alignment is important and um, what could be the impact of the misalignment for the organization? Shruti, what's your take on this? Um, Maria, I believe we're talking about uh, two different teams, right? Uh, customer service agents 
who are like the, what do we call them? The eyes and ears of the business. And they know what your customer need and they what they expect, what they think of your product. And if your organization is also in the technology software industry, then developers will keep your product running. That means cooperation between these teams is inevitable. Uh, but what we see is that very few companies have clear workflows for this kind of teamwork between the devs and the support teams. Uh, now, each team usually has its own set of tools, right? So you have your service teams in your help desk, ITSM softwares, and then engineers on uh, dev platforms. Uh, the larger organization, it's more likely that uh, one tech stack has little in common with the other. So you would say that, you know, ITSM um, um, methodologies are like very different from what we'd follow from development, say Scrum, Agile, et cetera. Uh, this also means that information is in um, silo, inaccurate data, your uh, customer agent would miss deadlines. Um, integration of these both tools would mean that you would remove any technical barriers to collaborate between these teams. That would mean that these teams can achieve better results and uh, they can, the customer facing service agents can uh, reply to your customers on time. Yeah, I think that's my thoughts. Yeah, sure. Thank you. That's, I think that's important. Uh, Jordan, would you like to add anything? I think most was said by Shruti, uh, but what I had in mind as well is one doesn't live without the other. So you need a support team lives only because there is development team and vice versa. So keeping them aligned and keeping them uh, linked together is kind of um, a natural, I can't find the English word, but yeah, you get the, the drift I'm going for. Yeah. And what are the the options you recommend your customers when they come to, to you and say, we feel this pain. So what 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 would you recommend? What are the options are there? Uh, we look at the specific teams in uh, individually, like how big is the company, uh, where are they in their in their growth? Uh, for smaller teams, it may make sense to use chat tools because it's very easy, it's very convenient, it's very quick. Um, the problem is as you grow, it gets a little bit messy. It gets difficult to find back information, especially towards, yeah. Uh, if if you remember a question from two weeks ago, try finding that in the chat with 20 other people. Um, so another solution is to get everyone the same system, um, but there as well, the more you grow, the less feasible it becomes. Teams need their own tools to be productive. Uh, you don't want to force a tool on a certain team because it can cost productivity. Not every tool is made for, uh, well, the combination of both teams. So you're kind of stuck in a situation where you make configuration just for the sake of it. Um, so, and once they're mature enough, or one we, once we see that it's really needed, uh, we definitely go for integration in, in most cases. Um, yeah. um, all right, thank you. And Majid, because you're talking to customers who, who are interested in specifically integration, so they already there, maybe they already tried doing it with, uh, with chat tools, they tried this, they tried that, now they're considering integration. So uh, I would assume the next step would be to, to get a green light from top management to uh, do the proof, proof of concept or to evaluate this uh, integration possibility, integration uh, solution, right? Yeah, I mean, eventually, yeah, definitely. But uh, I think there'll be like a step uh, before this as well, like where probably the need would be felt by a business user. The pain would actually be felt by the business user themselves, and they would want to like kind of validate to a certain extent whether uh, the tool that they're looking for actually would satisfy uh, their requirements. So I don't know, some people do it by reading reviews, Googling, stuff like that. Some people go to actual live demo to see whether the pain can be addressed or not. And then yes, definitely uh, they need to talk to management to get like a green light for, for that POC for sure. Okay, and the step after that would be then gathering requirements. Yeah, definitely. Like, so if they, uh, if, if they have a, a level of commitment whereby they say that, okay, this tool does make sense for us, then uh, I think the, the industry standard right now is to gather all the integration requirements on a POC document whereby the customer would be able to put this down in black and white as to what exact mappings he's looking for, what business logic does he want uh, to be implemented within the integration solution. Now, this really works both ways. It's beneficial for both parties, the vendor as well as the customer. 
because once you have it down on paper, you can uh, you can do a time estimation, you can do an effort estimation, as, and you can basically define the success criteria for this POC, whereby the both parties would consider it a success. So yeah, requirements gathering in a fairly detailed manner would be the next logical step. All right. So, but I, I'm still like a, a little bit at loss. Like, where to start? There is so much things, right? So, Shruti, from product management point of view, how do you think? What is the most essential information that is ne necessary for each team? Uh, I guess uh, when uh, we, you know, talk to customers and organizations, we see that sharing critical information regarding the customer's issue helps engineering team prioritize the work. So uh, say there are two issues with, uh, you know, equal difficulty, uh, checking with the support, uh, what's the impact, like what's the priority, right? So that's really important to know uh, what kind of, uh, uh, request should get uh, should get prioritized. Uh, also, um, I would say linking issues. Linking issues would mean um, because you know two different teams are uh, working on two different platforms. Linking issues would help put work together, and they can work towards this common goal, which is helping the customer. Uh, but most importantly, uh, when we talk to customers, right, from a developer perspective, they need more customer context. Hey, what's the customer saying? Uh, what are their comments? Uh, especially attachments. Attachments, uh, what, what does the error look like, right? All of these um, uh, conversations of these attachments are really valuable when you want to understand what the customer is facing. And these inputs really help the uh, developer or the engineering team who's working on that. All right, so it's subject, description, comments, attachments, priority, status. Um, Jordan, would you add anything? Would you feel that there are some things that are usually like kind of left out of the initial scope, but then add it later? Um, I think definitely in the first scope, it's important to focus on those initial, um, you, you can't say you have an integration without having those things, but all the rest is the extra benefit you can get from it. And we're talking about third party apps, for example, they come with their data. It's a little bit more complex, so you want to keep, keep that out of your initial setup because you want it there, but you don't want the, all the rest to suffer from it. So you're adding that in multiple iterations. Um, if you have specific formatting across the tools that you want to really bring to a beautiful highlight, uh, that also takes a little bit more time. So you don't want to overdo it in the beginning. All those extra business logics, the more complex cases that is typically done in, in more inter iterations. Okay. Um, so Majid, I'm, I'm wondering like, because you and me were from Exalate and we are in the product business, for us, it's very important to avoid these uh, iterations, right? We need to be able to uh, make the requirements correct from the day one. And uh, is there any best practices how we do it? Uh, what what do we usually recommend to our customers or prospects? Well, I, I, I kind of echo what Jordan and Shruti said. Like, uh, if you had the luxury of starting off like really simple and then building like in iterative phases, that'd be really nice. But uh, you don't always have that, right? There are time constraints and uh, there are project constraints from the client end, actually, not always from uh, the vendor end. But yeah, that that sometimes becomes a problem. So. Uh, how we usually do this, Maria, is that we uh, have discovery sessions with clients where we kind of showcase uh, what the integration does kind of out of the box, right? So something what Shruti was saying, like the basic fields such as summary, description, comments, attachments, some basic stuff, which just works out of the box bidirectionally. So once the client kind of sees that uh, that, that bottom line is always there, and then uh, they build on top of that. So we have conversations with them regarding how their everyday workflows are, how their support agent kind of opens like a JIRA ticket and then goes to a Slack channel or a group email address, like what their usual workflow is. And then the idea is to solve all those like uh, challenges with integration workflows uh, wherever possible really. So that's the conversation we engage in and uh, it's usually, yeah, very fruitful. A few things that we usually pick out, which we really want to talk about with clients is usually workflow orchestrations. So it's a topic which is customized in every case that we deal with, right? So some people would prefer 
that if a Jira status changes, that should change statuses on their actual ticket, but some people don't like that. Some people would have that done in a very selective manner. So that conversation is also very important to have, kind of opens the mind of the customer as well as to what the possibilities are, what they exactly need to, to do. And then lastly, it's the custom fields as well, which uh, get a lot of our attention. Like, uh, how, how would you map like to map them? You have so much flexibility with like integration. Would you like to pick a value from field A and just copy it to field B? Or would you rather use them more intelligently in that you would maybe keep your system fields intact? So what I mean by system fields is that your status, priority, stuff like that, you don't want to change them as a result of the integration, but you would rather have some visibility over what the remote end is doing. So have the remote status and remote priority kind of populated within custom fields would be like an interesting way of using that as well. So uh, yeah, so after these conversations, we kind of encourage the clients to definitely uh, complete the POC requirements document so that we have some idea of where we're going with this. So it helps them. Um, but uh, do you also like educate customers showing how the end result might look like? Yeah, that's, that's the thing. So you start off with the basic, like the bare minimum, as I said, like what works out of the box. So once you show them that, you have confidence that, okay, you have that bottom line there anyway, and then you build on top of that. Nice. Could you please show how this end result could look like, like given all the fields that we already mentioned? Uh, yeah, sure. Sure. Bear with me a second. Uh, can you confirm if you're able to see a Zendesk screen now? Yeah, we do. Cool. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, as you we were saying, so support, uh, so support uses a variety of tools, but I think Zendesk is the globally most uh, common one right now. So a support team uses Zendesk uh, for customer facing con conversations and all that. But yes, obviously they'll need to liaise with a Jira uh, developer who would definitely be working in a software project within Jira on probably Agile or Scrum methodologies. So uh, I've kind of like uh, done a use case. Uh, let's, let's talk, let, let's walk through this as like a conversation to see how this goes. So let's say we receive a ticket saying that uh, the submit uh, button isn't working, right? So descriptive. So a customer opens a ticket saying that the submit button is not working on his application or whatever. And this gets assigned to a support agent, which in this case would be myself. And let's say that the support agent categorizes the ticket as a problem ticket and prioritizes is as urgent. So some of the very like uh, common triage features which any support team would be doing. Now, once he decides that he needs help, uh, from a developer, he doesn't really have to need his instance and he just exhalates the ticket over to uh, the development team. Now, what happens is that uh, the integration tool now creates a Jira ticket, a Jira counterpart ticket based on whatever rules we've decided and uh, programmed in already. So I believe the problem ticket gets created as a bug ticket on Jira, but we'll, we'll check that shortly. So we get a, Jira ticket number and we get an actual hyperlink which we can just open in Jira to see uh, the ticket that is being created. Right, so a couple of things, small things to note. So the priority came over as highest because there's no urgent in that. So it's just like a mapping which we're doing. And uh, the assignee on the Zendesk ticket, which was myself, became the reporter on the Jira ticket, which kind of makes sense. Uh, then let's say, uh, the ticket gets picked up by a developer who marks it in progress. Now, a few things can happen, and this ties back to what I was saying about how you use custom fields. So right now, when I mark my ticket as in progress and change the assignee, now there are so many ways of doing it, of how you would do this. You could maybe change the assignee on the Zendesk ticket, uh, maybe reflect that, but how we've done it is we've used the custom fields to reflect who the Jira engineer is, and what the Jira ticket status is. So once again, we're not really touching the status on our ticket, but just like kind of reflecting all that information uh, still within Zendesk. Now, common sync and stuff has been synchronized as well. So let's say uh, we add an internal note saying, uh, when will they fix this, I wonder? <laughs> or will they ever fix it, I wonder? <laughs> So all, all these internal conversations that 
Zendesk the agents have amongst themselves will not make it to uh, the actual Jira ticket. And it's pretty similar with Jira as well. Uh, so if, if a Jira comment is marked as restricted to a certain group, this should not make it back to uh, the Zendesk ticket. But if, uh, if Jira wants to make like a public comment, that should uh, make it back to uh, the Zendesk ticket, the idea being that all the support agents would be like updated with it. So, so far what we've done is that the internal conversations that are taking place on both ends are not reflected back on the other system, while any public updates that happen would uh, go back to the other system. In the meanwhile, let's say that uh, another client reports the same issue. So let's say we have ticket one reporting kind of a similar issue. Now, if the support agent realizes that, okay, this is what is going on, and he knows that uh, there's already a bug out there with the number EX0063, what he does is he fills in the existing bug field and basically exhalates the ticket. Right, so he has realized that, okay, there's already an existing bug for this and uh, let's send this to development, let's link this to development again. And let's say for good measure, we have another one. We'll do exactly the same thing here as well. Right, and we'll link that to development as well. Now, what happens is that uh, the support tickets keep accumulating, right? So uh, if you have 10, 10 users reporting exactly the same issue, you don't want like to report different bugs and get developers into trouble. You essentially want to link all these with the same uh, with the same bug. So what happens on the Jira side is that if you open the XLA panel out here, you see all the links of the tickets that uh, have been linked to uh, to your to, to this bug essentially. So you can see that there's a list of three tickets now uh, listed here. Now, basically what happens is that if you make any updates on this ticket now, so let's say uh, we are close to a fix here. So any public update that you make on the Jira ticket now gets in, essentially broadcasted to all the support tickets downstream, right? Now, again, you can customize all the different aspects of this, but uh, that's how we've initially set this up. So you'll see that the comment would flow back to all essentially all the related tickets. So I'm not gonna, yeah, we're close to a fix here. And this could this could be any number of these. Now let's say that it's been finalized. Uh, let's say that the Jira ticket is about to close, the bug is about to close, so the developer marks it as done and chooses a fixed version uh, to reflect what version it got fixed in. Now, uh, again, the way we've done this is uh, that this would add a comment, this action would add a comment to uh, the Zendesk ticket saying that the resolution has been completed on the bug. So it's kind of like a visual reminder as well for the support agent that, okay, go do something now because it's been resolved. The fixed version has synced over. And this is a trigger for uh, the support agent then to proceed from there on in. Now, all this is like very, very customized behavior. You can change it in any manner whatsoever, but hopefully kind of this gives you an idea of Maria what we how we present this to the clients to give them more ideas about how uh, and what is really possible. Perfect. Thank you, Manjit. So guys, we just saw how the end result could look like, right? Uh, so and by the way, if you have any questions, you're welcome to drop them in the Q and a section. Um, not necessarily about what we talked just right now, but anything that is regarding the support and develop integration, we'll be happy to answer your questions at the end of the webinar. So um, but okay, so now as we see the end result, now I am curious about the implementation part. So it means it's time for another poll. Um, I'm curious to know, let's see what I'm curious to know about. <laughs> okay, let's do it. So which option do you think is the best or and easiest to get approval and implement? So we have this buy simple automation tool, use native integration possibilities of the platform that you use, build the integration on your own, purchase a two-way sync app from the marketplace, uh, buy an integration platform for a vendor or some other solution that is on the table. All right, I see um, 
answers start come in. So you have a few more seconds to uh, give your vote. Okay. Uh, right, right. It's interesting. I'll share the results with you in just a couple of seconds. So guys, uh, last five seconds to make your vote. Five, four, three, two, one. Nice. Let's share the result. So um, as you can see, the uh, surprisingly very common option is uh, purchase a two-way sync tool from the marketplace. Um, then there is also quite popular option for to use native integration possibilities of the tool. That's a very good one too. Um, the next uh, option is build the integration on your own. Uh, another uh, less popular, uh, but still an option, less popular option, uh, build a uh, user symbol, build it, sorry, <laughs> build a simple automation tool, buy a simple automation tool. And there's also uh, one uh, person who um, voted for other. Could you please let us know what other is in, in the comment section? I'm, I'm really curious about that. Um, all right, so let's now cover all of the uh, options that have been mentioned and let's talk about the, uh, let's start with the automation tools. So Shruti, what do you think when it makes sense for automation tools? Oh yeah, um, automation. Automation is something that's been asked a lot by, uh, you know, Atlassian customers as well when I talk to them. Um, and when you when you see uh, automation tools, they are uh, springing up that promise of being efficient and productive by simply handing over data automatically and processing it through few conditions, right? If else, so. Um, but we, we see that right now the market is going through the roof with all automation tools. They're being added every week. New kinds of automation um, tools are like available with any of the uh, software tools that you're using today. Uh, most of them, when you see, are uh, uh, programmed interfaces, right? And in this, workflows and processes can be automated and shaped according to numerous conditions, like I mentioned, if, else. And uh, they do most of your repetitive task, saves a lot of time and increases efficiency. Uh, but in automation, you would say that there are varying degrees to what can be automated. Uh, if it's uh, a tool that can sync both platforms and uh, can, you know, automate, uh, say, bi-directionally, that's, that's fine. One-way automation tool sometimes does have limitation, cannot be the optimal way. Uh, mm -hmm. Two-way sync along with automation would be beneficial, but then it, again, you know, uh, varies from what an organization would want and what they're looking for. Those, those are my thoughts regarding you know, automation and what well, syncing would be a little bit better as well. Oh, all right. So I still think it's a, it's a could be a very good way uh, way to to start. Um, but then also another option that we have and it was quite popular in the poll as well is to use the uh, native capability, native integration cap capabilities of the tool that that you have, like whether you're using Jira, ServiceNow, Zendesk. Uh, there are some things that you can already use there. So uh, Majid. Uh, I know that you have some experience there. Could you please share your experience and knowledge? Yeah, sure. So, so yeah, it's, it's not really a surprise that the native integration is uh, as popular in the poll as uh, you saw. Uh, the reason basically is essentially the ease of use, right? So each native tool is built uh, within the platform that it supports, basically. So just using Zendesk as an example, so Zendesk would have an integration tool, which is kind of embedded within the Zendesk platform. The usability, the user experience would be all geared towards a Zendesk user. So a Zendesk user would definitely love the native integration tool. Uh, the problem that occurs is that when it starts speaking, when that tool starts speaking to the other side, which could be a totally different IDSM system using Agile or something else, uh, like we were like we were just looking at. So so just considering the use case that we were doing, like if you, if the fix version gets added within Jira and the ticket gets closed, it would add a custom comment on the Zendesk side and do some other actions, which uh, usually a support agent would do manually. So because the native integration tool does not really integrate that well with the other system, it's not built to talk to us. And the, the use cases that it can implement are very, very limited, right? So. The, the bottom line always with the native integration solution is that if your use case is kind of basic and you just want to get some information across and just some basic field sync, then it's fine. 
But if you're like an admin who's looking to build complex business logic around it and uh, basically get value addition from this integration, like simplify your business processes, uh, reduce the number of time, amount of time spent by agents doing like all these tasks, then the native integration uh, solution is usually, uh, it has limitations in that respect. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, so what I heard is, uh, so first of all, it uh, feels very native of the uh, platform who developed it for, and for the users of this platform. Uh, what I also know is that oftentimes they, they, they are free of charge, which is a very good bonus oftentimes. And that is actually like uh, lowers the threshold of people to actually start using the integrations. Uh, but the minus is that because it's oftentimes free, uh, the, the support is... Uh, well, it's, it's less. So oftentimes you have to figure out a lot of things on your own and then it's quite limited, right? So Jordan, then I'm thinking what would be then the next step, right? We tried automation tool, we tried um, the native capabilities of the platform that we use. So what is next? What do you recommend to your customers? Then we go in the fun stuff, I think personally, is that when it gets more complex, you start to have a little bit more freedom in thinking of your solution. Um, one way to go about it is to make your own integration. So build from scratch, uh, focus on your business case, focus specifically on what your need, uh, which is a plus and at the same time a pitfall because you're focusing on one thing and in large organizations, one thing is not going to cut it. So the next business case comes along, this team says, oh, you can integrate with Zendesk and Jira, for example. That's awesome. We want that too. Okay, yes, but we have a different flow. Okay, back to drawing board and quickly you're adding hours and hours of, um, well, analysis and development and maintenance costs and whatever. Um, so your total cost of ownership can quickly become big, but if that's what you want to go for, we definitely support it. So building your own integration, an option. What we also often go for is um, having a, a platform or an, a, a non native tool kind of so more of an integration uh, that is not specific to one or more tools something that's more generic something that can link zendesk and jira but at the same time also throw in another connector that um, some team uh, on, on the moon uses for example uh, they, they have something very specific so you want something that's very flexible something that you can easily add on top of without having all the the burden of com configuring it yourself or well, of course, you will have the configuration, but building from scratch, you don't want to do that in those cases. So that is something we also offer uh, as a solution, which tends to be more cost effective in a way, because you can reuse a lot of things that have already been done for you. A lot of other customers also use it. So it's something that another vendor, uh, so the integration vendor is basically taking care of. Uh, they do the documentation, they provide you everything that you need. Um, so. Those two options with the second one more for customers that want to go flexible, don't want to have the overheading costs um, while building your own integration if they really want to have something in-house and take care of that. Yeah, so basically your options is either to build it yourself or to opt for a more robust integration solution from 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 a vendor. And yeah, to be honest, I would agree, like even the discussion about the to build it yourself or to buy it is com it can be completely other discussion with a lot of things to uh, take into account and the decision is actually depends upon the the complexity of the integration the the number of change requests that you anticipate and the depth of the integration that you want to build so i, I would agree but then um shruti when do you think it's the make sense? So, so let's say that we decided that we, we're going to buy a solution. We're not going to build it, right? We don't have time. We don't have resources for whatever reason. So um, when it makes sense to opt for this, uh, for instance, integration uh, for integration solution, but which has no code interface, right? It has a visual nice drag and drop interface. And even better if it's flow based, maybe. Um, so if we need to understand like the benefit of using a flow based and no code integration and I, one of the things that uh, tops my mind when i think about it is a non technical user can create these integrations without you know having to write the code uh, so the things that even i've explored are like drag and, uh, drag and drop elements and uh, you can just create your own workflows uh, you can create your own automation really quickly 
And uh, you don't have to just uh, sit and wait or depend on a person who codes or like a developer to have your integration implemented, right? So it's it's pretty fast. It's very quick. You can do it by yourself. Uh, maybe uh, you may not be able to cover all of your requirements, but having a running integration between the platforms, I would say it reduces a lot of manual work and that is still better. It provides a very accessible uh, user-friendly way to automate most of your process between, uh, you know, ITSM and Dev platform, and it improves efficiency to to a large extent. You can build dedicated uh, two-way flows, like I mentioned, right? And uh, it will allow you to support uh, um, support tickets, and you can uh, you can uh, turn these support tickets uh, into, say, uh, a task like a Jira task. Um, you know, so all updates, even comments, are synchronized both ways. Mm -hmm. from your ITSM platform and your development platform. Um, your support team can track escalated tickets without having to leave your tool, while a developer can contribute without leaving their tool as well. So all of these without being dependent on somebody else to build it, whereas uh, someone with a non-technical background can easily use a, a flow-based no-code tool. Nice. So um, to sum up, so the benefits are, so first of all, you don't have to wait for anyone. You're not dependent. You can just start quickly and do it yourself, right? And and then the next thing is that it's two-way, right? So it, both teams, they get an update uh, from each side. Um, but, you know, Jordan, from our previous conversations, I do remember that you were more on the... Well, you're not a big fan of the drag and drop interface and you're more on the coding side uh, and you you would rather like go for something fun. <laughs> um, so so can, can you explain why? So so why would you opt for a solution that has this um, code face and interface, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mostly flexibility. So, okay, drag and drop, very easy, very nice, very, very good looking UI uh, and a child can make it, right? Um, it's, and, it's very and it's good. also fun. <laughs> it's fun too. I agree. I, I like playing around with it. But there, there is a point where um, someone else has already thought about the flows that are built into that tool. So someone else has basically made your use case for you. While if you have something that is script, you can basically go any use case. So you're not limited to any um, predefined analysis. You're really the master of your own uh, data set, the master of your own integration, which is something I prefer. Okay, initially it costs a little bit of effort to get the, the code running, but with proper uh, platforms, you have a lot of documentation that is available. Uh, so it's really just getting that small oomph in there. And then once it's up and running, there is really not much to do extra, but you still have that flexibility. And if something else needs to be added, yeah, it's just a matter of writing a two lines extra of code. And instead of dragging and dropping for 20, 30 minutes, you write two lines in two minutes and you're good to go. So my preference is always, uh, yeah, the, the flexibility with coding. Nice. Uh, nice. Thank you so much. So um, I'm not sure if uh, it's clear for our audience what we talk about, because we're talking about, right, we um, now considering if we should choose uh, a solution that is integration solution that is, has a visual interface or a scripting interface, right? So uh, Majid, can you please show um, the insights of the solution that you showed us before? So how does it look like? What, how um, code-based solution could look like from, from the behind the scenes? Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, uh, this will just take a minute. So. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm to, uh, like, let's consider that we're the same Jira system that we were looking at earlier. And this time, let's uh, talk about something different. So let's use Azure DevOps as uh, the target system. So I've got a ticket already in Jira, save time, and let's send this over to the other side. Uh, once it arrives on the other side, let's uh, like kind of create a use case in our mind as to what we want to achieve. And then I'll use that as an example uh, of like showcasing how the script would be uh, done using that part. So we'll just wait for it to uh, get created. And the same same kind of logic applies. Like uh, once the Azure work item is created, you would get uh, a link to that work item within the Jira ticket. And you can just open it from there in order to get it uh, going. Mm -hmm. 
Right, so the work item that's been created is 9649 and we'll just open it directly. So now we have our replica ticket. Okay, so the example that I want to showcase is that on the Jira ticket, I'll have a custom field called color name out here. So just a free form text field called color name on my Jira ticket. I want to take this across to uh, the Azure side and Azure does not have that field, but Azure has some other field called color in Jira, right? Just two absolutely distinct fields in two absolutely distinct systems. So how would we go about doing this? Right, so let's take a quick look at how we would do this. I'll just open this in another tab so that we don't have to navigate back. Right, so the Xlate uh, application, which was integrating the whole thing is embedded within your Jira admin interface, as you can see. So I'm not, I don't have to leave the issue tracker or anything. So I'll open the connection that I have and I'll be greeted with these scripts, which are kind of pre-written. And what I want to do is from the Jira side, I want to send out a field to Azure DevOps. So I would be editing my outgoing script and using the template already provided here and just customizing it. So essentially, oh, this is very little customization. Okay. Because yeah, the name that came out of the box is pretty similar. So all I need to do is send the color name field from Jira to the others. Added a line of code, published it, all done. Okay, but there's another part to this because Azure has to kind of receive that field and populate it into this field called color in Jira. So we'll have to do a bit of configuration on the Azure side as well. So again, uh, the Xlate extension lives out here within, uh, within the Azure interface. So again, you don't have to leave the application or anything uh, in order to configure it. Right, so we'll open our connection again by hitting the editing button. And this time, we're not concerned with the outgoing because Azure is going to receive that field and deal with it. So what we want to do is we want to populate our work item custom field called color in Jira with the value that is arriving from, from the other side, right? So what we'll need to say is color name that is arriving from Jira. Cool. And that should be that really. Uh, so the value that is arriving from Jira has been picked up and basically assigned to a custom field called uh, color in Jira. Right, so let's publish it on this end as well. So remember what we've done, we've added a line on the Jira side to send the field. We've added a line on the uh, Azure side to receive the field. And now we're ready to give it a quick test. So let's say I add uh, a color here. And what I expect is that if I've uh, scripted everything correctly, then uh, Jira would send that field value out to Azure and Azure would populate it into a field called color in Jira. And yeah, these two would obviously remain in sync. Uh, so yeah, that's how you basically integrate scripts into your uh, integration app. And this is how you would go about customizing it by adding like little snippets, uh, which answer your business case. So hope that was clear for you, Maria. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and I hope for everyone else, if you guys have any questions, let us know because we're already very close uh, to that part. So uh, before we go into the Q&A, um, I wanted to ask our speakers, um, what would be the one piece of advice that you would give to people that are starting, just starting their integration journey? Um, let's start with Jordan. Um, well, uh, don't go for the, <laughs> the flow tools. <laughs> no, uh, I'm kidding. Uh, go well, fits your specific business. There's always like a balance in uh, how mature your business is and how mature the solution is you're looking for. But I'm just uh, leaving the note here with a flow uh, based solution. You cannot convert the yellow text into a yellow color, but with, uh, with the code you could. So just throwing it out, coding is better. <laughs> My drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, Majid, what about you? Yeah, but I've got another way to define this like coding versus visual thing. So when you're connecting to the moon via like a visual tool, you just connect to a point on the moon. But with the script, you can connect to a specific grain on a specific crater on the moon. 
So that's how, like, that's how much of a granular control you get using uh, the scripts. My advice would be what it always is, uh, spend a lot of time and dedication on the requirements phase. Uh, write it down, write the business flow down, understand exactly what you're looking for, and then go out and look for a tool that meets those particular requirements. That would be it, basically. All right, and Shruti? <laughs> Oh, oh, well, the first thing on my list is, you know, having a debate with Jordan after this, regarding <laughs> the development mm -hmm. and new But uh, yeah, I, I agree with what uh, Majid said. Uh, check if, you know, uh, after doing uh, the requirement listing, if your potential vendor is able to fulfill most of your needs, not be 100%, but most of it, right? And, and yes, the common things of, you know, ease of use and how easily it is to modify uh, the tool without having to, um, uh, you know, pay extra to the vendor. So if that's that expandability feature is available and it's good, um, ch check user experience, check for uh, previous client reviews, what have they told about the product, how they felt about it, right? And uh, yeah, uh, uh, like you would see it with any software tools, scalability, stability, security, and, and most importantly, also um, the, the support that they would provide, upgrades, patches. So these are some of the things that I would list down while uh, looking for an optimal vendor. Nice. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to add something a little bit for myself. And actually, I'm going to quote Jordan. And in our previous conversation, he always said that the good thing is always start small start basic and then layer up the difficulty as you go. This way you can um, bring up all the complexity that you need without any very hard implications on your systems and make it like a very nice and smooth transition for everyone who is using it. Um, all right, so we have uh, just a couple of questions. So I'm gonna share my screen again. All right, okay. I hope you can see my screen. Nice. Okay, so the first question is that what can I do to convince my manager to allocate time to evaluate one of the integration solutions you mentioned? So, um, Jordan, what would you say? <laughs> what would you, how would you convince uh, the manager on the other side? Oh, I'm a bad one to pick because I was thinking of jokes to answer this, but I have to answer <laughs> properly. Um, I think. Uh, what I often see with customers um, is that making a small business case helps a tremendous lot, just quickly highlighting where the pain point is and how much time you lose without that communication or without the proper communication and how much benefit you gain in productivity. Um, like when, if, if the solution would be a good fit, like how much do you get from that? Every man hour in business is costs money. So it's, just put some estimates on how much productivity you gain by having a tool instead of reaching out to someone waiting uh, or yeah, all that annoying stuff that you have to go through without a proper tool. Um, and once you have some rough numbers, present that and then it kind of translates itself. The managers like to see productivity and save of money. So you have to kind of show how you save that money by increasing productivity. All right. And what was the joke answer? Strike. Go on strike. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, okay. So the next question is, if I'm to use Excelay, do I need to have admin rights on both sides? Uh, Majid, that is for you. Yeah, that's, that's a yes and a no. So uh, to use it, no, not at all. So you saw me on a ticket interface from where I was able to hit the button and send the ticket over to the other side. So you don't even need any access to the other side in order, in order to be able to uh, use it like as, a, as an end user, like I showed you. In order to configure it and uh, in order to do it, you need admin rights to your particular own issue tracker, right? Uh, and to answer your question exactly, no, Xlate is 100% decentralized, uh, which basically means that each uh, side of the integration is 100% independent to do what they want. You do not need any access whatsoever uh, to the other side. All right, thank you. So uh, I also wanted to mention that we also have some free resources that you can download from the website if you're interested in to learn more about the uh, support and development uh, alignment 
and also we have some interesting reads on the integration journey and all the co how connect specific um uh, platform that we mentioned using Accelate. Um, so if you're curious, um, our team, we're going to drop some uh, links to the chat so you can have a look. Um, also, if you have additional questions, you can always reach out to Majid directly. Um, but keep in mind that he's a busy guy, so um, be fast and uh, reach out to him as soon as possible. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for joining the webinar. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. It was my pleasure to, to be your host today. And I hope that everyone uh, will take something from me today. And let's connect on LinkedIn. Uh, I also will ask our team to drop our um, LinkedIn URLs. Um, let's connect and let's stay in touch. I hope you have a wonderful day ahead and see you the next one. Bye, guys. Yes, thanks, Ria. Bye. 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 Yeah, bye.